Good morning. Happy Resurrection Day. We invite you all to stand as we sing our call to worship. Christ the Lord is risen today. death, where is thy sting? And O grave, where is thy victory? When Jesus rose up on that first Easter morning, that's exactly what he did. Is he pulled the sting out of death so we can live with him forevermore. Can you say amen to that church? Amen. Welcome this morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your resurrection weekend and resurrection Sunday. We're excited that you are here. And we're excited about worshiping the Lord this morning. If you're visiting with us today, uh, thank you for making this a part of your day. Thank you for choosing to come join us. If it's your first time visiting, I'd ask that you take a uh, visitor's information card sometime during the course of this service and fill that out so we can have a little record of your visit and be praying for you as well. There's also some prayer request cards in the back of the pew in front of you. Fill those out. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Uh, we do that not just on Sundays, but all throughout the week. So we're glad you're here. We're excited about what the Lord is doing. Uh, I, I, I'm already warmed up. I'm ready to go. We had a sunrise service at Lawrence Park at 7 o'clock, so this is round two for me. I'm rip-roaring and ready to go. So uh, those of you that were there this morning, thank you for coming. You will not get the same message. It's not going to be a repeat. We have something a little bit different this morning. But we're just looking forward to worshiping with you. Uh, just a reminder, no services this evening. Uh, we want you to have the rest of the day to spend with your family uh, here on Easter Sunday. But we will be back uh, 6 o'clock Wednesday night for uh, our midweek Bible study and prayer meeting. So we hope that you will join us for that. And if you're looking for a place to plug into a church to call your home, we'd love to have you here. Sunday school is at 930 every Sunday morning. We have classes and teachers for each and every person that shows up from um, from the young ones all the way up to the senior adults. So uh, come be a part of those small groups uh, and what's going on in those classes. Uh, I just want to remind you that our Annie Armstrong Easter offering is going on. There should be some envelopes available for you either in the back of the pews in front of you or out in the foyer. 
uh, be praying about what you would give. All of that goes to the North American Mission Board uh, in their work and their effort that they do right here uh, in the United States. Uh, next Saturday, uh, we will have our second annual drive-through prayer ministry from 9 to noon. We'll be set up here in the West parking lot. It's just an opportunity for people to pass by, come in, uh, talk with us, let us know what's going on with us for, to be able to pray over whatever's going on in their lives. So come by and see us. If you can help with that, the sign-up sheet is out in the foyer. Uh, but most important, let your friends know. that They may be going through something that uh, we can help them with. Uh, they may be going through something that we need to pray over them about. They may be looking for some answers that we can offer them. So that ministry is going to be available next Saturday. Uh, ladies, uh, if you are going to the Aspire Women's Conference on the 29th of this month, uh, we need your money in by the 20th, uh, $25. We'll reserve your ticket. Uh, if you don't have that paid, we'll not register you, but if you'll get that in, we will go ahead and register you. It's about three hours on the 29th. That's a Friday night, and it will be in Homa uh, with three separate speakers that night. So they're looking forward to that ladies' night out. But today we worship a risen king, we worship a risen savior, and he arose from the grave to assure our eternal life with him, just as he said. And as we go through this service this morning, the songs that we sing, the message you hear, here's, here's what I want you to try to think of. How would I have felt if I was in that group on that first morning when I went to the tomb and saw that the stone was rolled away. What would be your emotions? Here's what the angel said to that first group of ladies that came to the tomb on Easter morning. He said, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen, just as he said. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day, rose again. The empty tomb assures that Jesus was who he said he was and that he's coming back for those who accepted him as their personal Lord and Savior. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we love you so much and we just thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for the victory that you've given to us through the empty tomb. And Lord, we celebrate today what you have done for us. And as we come together as a body of believers as we come together as a church, as we come together to worship you, Lord God, let our hearts just overflow with the thankfulness and the gratitude that we have that you were that one-time sacrifice for our sins. And not only that, but you rose up with the promise of you coming back again for those who faithfully wait and look for you. We turn this service over to you, Lord God, and my, my hope and my prayer is that each and every person uh, would encounter you in a way that they've never experienced before, Lord. I pray that those who are coming in with burdens, that they will find the answers, that you will give them rest and hope. Those who do not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that today would be that day that they would step out in faith, confess their sins, and accept you as their personal Lord and Savior. And we look forward to what you're going to do this day and in this service. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship. Low in the grave he lay, but up from the grave he arose. Let's continue singing hymn 160, Low in the Grave He Lay. Oh, 
freedoms. Let's stand as we sing offertory. so much to be thankful for. We thank you most of all, first of all, and most of all for being our Savior and for the resurrection of today that gives us the opportunity to be able to resurrect with you. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today that's not accepted Jesus as their Savior, today might be the day. Lord, I thank you so much for the ones that are here, and I ask that you'd be the ones that are not here for whatever reason. We ask that you'd be the ones that are in the hospital and the ones that are sick and unable to attend. We just thank you for Brother Tracy and for the message he'll be bringing today. We ask again, if there's anyone here today that's not accepted Jesus today, will be the day. Thank you again for being our Savior, and we ask it all in his name. Amen.
No more sorrow. No more pain. No more suffering. And no more tears. And no more hot and humid Louisiana days. <laughs> Can you say amen to that? We'll drink of the river of living water freely for all eternity. Man, that gets me excited. That gets me fired up. And just think, today could be that day. This could be the very day that Jesus makes his second coming for those who belong to him. Easter Sunday, 2022. It could happen today. It could happen any minute now. That's not what my message is on, but that's where it's going for right now. That's just, that just gets me excited. Easter Sunday, spring when everything is bursting forth with new life, just like Jesus did on that day when the stone was rolled away. What was sleeping, what was cold, what was dead, burst forth with new life. Amen. A lot of things going on outside right now. Our seasons are changing. We are moving rapidly from winter to summer. There's not hardly any transition time here in South Louisiana. So here's your annual reminder. Stay hydrated. <laughs> Drink plenty of fluids. Uh, you're going to sweat a lot. Uh, it's very important, not just water, but something that will replace everything that your body needs uh, when you sweat. So what I'm about to say is going to sound a little bit like a commercial or an advertisement. If you'll stay with me, we're, we're going somewhere with it. Uh, the market is flooded these days with sports drinks that help you to stay hydrated, that quench your thirst. Uh, there's a lot of slogans, a lot of propaganda, a lot of commercials, a lot of advertisements. We see it everywhere. But the original, many of you know the story behind the original. It, it originated in the early 1960s. Most people think it happened in the University of Florida, but Florida State University actually started experimenting with a drink that had extra sugar, salt, and potassium in it that would replace what the athletes needed as they sweat in the hot, sweltering Florida sun during practices. So it wasn't until the mid-60s when the University of Florida got hold of what they were doing and began perfecting what is now known as the sports product, Gatorade, named after the University of Florida's mascot. And so it was marketed by PepsiCo in uh, the late 1960s. Um, it, it became known as one of the premier sports drinks. And so as colleges were using it, especially those in Florida, it began growing. Uh, the NFL got hold of it and it became the official sports drink of the NFL in 1983. In the first official Gatorade shower, which we all know they celebrate by dumping the water coolers over on the head coach after a big win, the first official Gatorade shower took place in 1985. And so along through the company's history, there's been many slogans. Uh, marketing has been a key factor in the company's success. They've utilized star athletes. Uh, one of them, the NBA superstar Mike, Michael Jordan, uh, they used him to promote their product, and, and the slogan that went along with it was what? Be like Mike. I want to be like Mike, so I'm going to drink some Gatorade, and it'll help me to perform just like uh, Michael Jordan. And so as that continued on, and the, the market became even more flooded with more and more sports drinks, they began amping up the slogans, more catchy. Uh, the, the most recent one and the most memorable one happened in the year 2002, and this is leading to the point in my sermon today. They would have a thirsty person when it didn't necessarily have to be an athlete. Uh, a lot of times they would use sports stars, but they began thinking we, we need to go outside of the sports realm with our marketing. So they would use construction workers. They would use people working out in the yard, mowing grass and so forth, because many other people could benefit from this. And the question that they asked was this, is it in you? And so what they were trying to promote is the things that have been replenished from out of your life. When you're feeling weak and tired because you're working, sweating, all of that stuff has been depleted from the body. What's in this bottle, it needs to be inside of you to help you accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. 
And so this morning as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, one of the main reasons that he came up out of the grave that day is so that he could be in you. To help you live the Christian life that you cannot live on your own. And there's many different places that I could go to in Scripture. The Scripture passage I chose this morning was out of Galatians. If you have your Bibles this morning, uh, open up to Galatians chapter 2. And the Apostle Paul makes several different references here about the fact that Jesus Christ actually wants to live inside of the life of a believer. And today we're going to talk about several ways that the indwelling Christ can be identified or related to in the life of someone who has accepted him as their personal Lord and Savior. As we all stand for the reading of God's Word out of honor and reverence for it, we're going to look at some key elements in this one passage to find out that we are in Christ. Christ is in us as believers. And as believers, we are to be like Christ. And we are with Christ as well. And we will be with Christ for all eternity one day. The Apostle Paul begins in Galatians chapter 2, verse 17. He said, But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are, all, are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. Here's where I want to focus in at, beginning in verse 20. Paul relates his life and his crucifixion of his own flesh to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I've died to the law. I'm no longer myself. I'm not living that life anymore. That life is behind me. And so here's what his claim in that is. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. That last verse is very, very key, especially if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Because if you're trying to gain eternal life any other way than through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul stated right there, he said, then Christ's death was totally in vain. Father God, we love you so much. We thank you for this day and for all you're doing. We just thank you for the fact, Lord God, that we can rejoice in your resurrection, knowing that the tomb is empty, knowing that you overcame death, hell, and the grave, knowing that you live forevermore, and knowing that you will one of these days come back and take those who have trusted in you with their lives forevermore. We look forward to what you're going to speak to us through this verse, Lord God, and through the scriptures that we will study. And I pray, Lord God, that our hearts will be opened up to the fact that you want to dwell inside of us to help us accomplish the life that we can't live on our own. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So there are six things that I want to look at that the indwelling Christ represents and that we can learn from. Not all of them will necessarily come from this passage. Um, like I normally do, I, I like to draw stuff out of just the context that we're reading out of. But I think there are some things that are closely connected to the indwelling Christ what we can learn from. Some of them will be found in this passage. Some of them will not be. The first thing that I want you to understand about the indwelling Christ, which is what Paul was teaching here, he says, it's not me that's living this life anymore. He's saying that Christ dwells inside of me. Through the power of his Holy Spirit, he has come to live inside of me. When I have crucified my flesh and the old man has died, the new man has been resurrected and Jesus Christ lives with inside of me. And so one thing you need to understand, one basic concept that you need to understand is that we believe that it's not just one God, but one God in three different parts. That is what we refer to as the Trinity. Now, we could spend all day trying to explain that and give you good examples on that. None of them would completely justify because our small, finite minds cannot 
comprehend something so infinite as a triune God. But basically, we believe in the Godhead. And, and if you search through Scripture, you will not find the actual word Trinity. It's not in there. But the teaching and the concept is there. On the day that Jesus was baptized, we see the Son coming to be baptized. The Father in heaven says, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am I'm well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove, the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all doing three separate works there at Jesus' baptism. But what we're going to talk about is the Spirit of the living God indwelling inside of us, and that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying here. The first thing that you need to see, number one, the indwelling Christ is a union. It is a union with the believer, someone who has confessed Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, his Holy Spirit comes and unites with our lives and our bodies. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, what we just read, the tail end of that. He says, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The indwelling Christ, he says, Christ lives in in me, that one word, I in, in the English language, we know what it represents. In the original language, in the Greek, it is spelled E-N, N. And it means a union with or join closely with. It's a marker to show association. And so a demonstration I had for you today about that. This glove that I have on its own, it can do nothing. As you can see, it's empty. There's nothing inside of it. It was created for a purpose, but on its own, just lying there, that glove can never fulfill its purpose. And that's just like most of us before we have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. We've been created for a purpose, but as long as we are without Christ in our lives, we're empty, we're hollow, and we're useless. We can't fulfill that purpose. But whenever we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, He comes and He lives inside of us. And we begin taking the shape and the form of Him to accomplish what God has created us for. And now the glove is not in control. What's on the outside is not in control, but what is on the inside is in control. And so your life as a believer it's not you living that life out, but it is Jesus Christ inside of you, filling you, moving you, and controlling you to do what you were created to do. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 says this. It says, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is our hope, is knowing that Jesus Christ is within us, by the power of his Holy Spirit. And through that, we have been sealed until the day of redemption. Not only does he control us, but it's identification as well. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And it's very unique to think that Christianity is the only world religion in which the deity that is worshipped desires to have that close bond. All other world religions, the deity that is worshipped remains distant. And the worshippers try their best to make sacrifices, do certain things to appease that God and try to draw closer to it. But yet that God stays distant from us. But God says, I want to be closely attached to your life. I want to be with you everywhere you go. I want to be inside of you with everything that you do. I want to control your mind, your thought, your body, your action, your ways. And I want you to become more like my son, Jesus Christ. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, but yet I want to live inside of you. The next thing I want you to see is that the indwelling Christ is an identification not only is it a union, but it is a way that we are identified through the life that we live out by the power of Christ that indwells within us. Romans chapter 8 verses 15 through 17 says that God's Holy Spirit is inside of you to make a witness out of you. 
Paul says, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Listen to this. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are a child of God. How can someone identify a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? By the way they walk, the way they talk, the way they act, the way they think, the way they respond to situations. And that is because the Holy Spirit is inside of you and he's bearing fruit that makes a witness out of you. John chapter 15 verse 5a, Jesus said, I want you to bear fruit for me. And this fruit will be an identifier that you belong to me and that you abide in me. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. And he even went as far as to say that without me, you can do nothing. Just like this glove without my hand in it. It can accomplish absolutely nothing on its own. So the indwelling Christ is an identification. It bears witness that we are children of God. And through the fruit that we bear, through the acts that we produce in our life for the Lord Jesus Christ, it lets others know, I'm a believer in the Lord. The things that I do, it's not because of me, it's because of the Christ who lives inside of me. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 26. This is something you've learned in VBS and Sunday school since you were a little bitty kid. The fruits of the Spirit are what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. Anytime you see a list like that in Scripture, just like the ingredients on the back of this bottle, the number one thing on the list is the most important and the one that it contains the most of. So if Galatians 5 says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, Guess what the greatest ingredient of a Christian life is? Love, not just for the Savior, but love for others as well. And that's a message that John echoes. 1 John chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Then dwelling Christ in it is an identification because of the love that we have through it. Look, let me tell you something. If it wasn't for Jesus living inside of me, there are some people in this world that I would not be able to love as much as I should. Same thing for you too. Don't look at me like that. You're just as guilty. You know it's true. There are certain people that we would not be able to have a relationship with if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ working inside of us, giving us those other aspects, the joy, the patience, the peace, the kindness. And we're identified with the Lord Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit that lives within us. 1 John chapter 4 says, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him. So our love for others is a measuring device that we are truly abiding in him and he is abiding in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him as an identifier. And he in God. And we know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So the indwelling Christ is an identification for a true believer. When Jesus was speaking to his apostles, he said there's many different ways that they will know that you are my disciples. He said, but there's one way for sure that others will know that you are my disciples and it's because of the love that you have for each other. The world is watching us, church. The world is watching what we're going to do in these deep, dark times. They've been watching us for two years as we go through this pandemic. They're watching us as our nation just goes um, 
the wrong direction in every way, shape, and form. And they're looking to see what do the believers do during a time like this. They stick together and they love each other. So a person who has truly been born again and has the Christ dwelling in them should be easily identified should be easily identified by their witness, by the fruit that they produce, and by the love that they have for each other. So not only is the indwelling Christ a union, not only is it an identification, but the indwelling Christ is a source of strength. I love 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. John says, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And so this glove is created for many different things. If I go to a job, it's dirty, it's nasty, I'm, I'm handling rough iron, rough wood, rough rope, whatever the case may be, something I'm trying to just get a grip on, this glove will actually help. It will give me some extra strength and protection through that time. It'll help me get a grip on the things that I normally would not be able to get a grip on. But this glove can by itself do nothing, but as long as it remains in union with the hand inside of it, it accomplishes tasks that it could not at one time do. And that's the same way as our life with the Lord Jesus Christ. Without Jesus, there are things that you just, it would be impossible for you to do, but with the Lord Jesus Christ living inside of you, he gives you a strength that you just can't imagine. John 15, 5, Jesus said, I said it just a minute ago, without me, you can do nothing. He said, but if you'll abide in me, I'll give you strength, and I'll help you to accomplish those things that you can't do on your own. Many of you grew up watching uh, Superman on TV, uh, maybe you read about him in comic books. We all know that normally out in public, who was he? He was mild manner reporter, Clark Kent. That's what we saw on the outside. But what happened when trouble came up? Somebody cried out for help. He heard a police siren, a fire truck. What would happen? I don't know what he'd do these days because there aren't any phone booths anymore. <laughs> he'd have a tough time with that. And no, I don't have a Superman outfit on underneath me, but... I think you'll get the picture. No matter where he went, no matter what he did, he was still Superman, but he kept that identification uh, hidden. And he didn't reveal it until it was time. But when the time came across, what happened? Boy, he'd pull that shirt open and there was that big S on his chest. And that's what the Holy Spirit living inside of you does as well. When you get to a situation where you think you just can't go anymore, God says, I got you. He says, I'm going to help you get through this. I'm going to give you power and strength that you didn't know that you had on your own. How do we get that power and the strength? We stay in God's word. We pray, and then God prepares us for what lies ahead. Philippians 4.13, many of you know this verse. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, does that mean you can accomplish superhuman feats? No, absolutely not. That's not what it's talking about. It doesn't mean you can jump a tall building or run through a brick wall or stop a freight train. That's not what it means. But what it means is there are situations in your life that you may encounter that the only way that you're going to make it through that is if you have the Lord Jesus Christ living inside of you, giving you strength and giving you power. So not only does the indwelling Christ make a union with us, not only is the indwelling Christ an identification for every believer, not only does the indwelling Christ give us strength when we need it the most, but the indwelling Christ also brings new life. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. That means that that old man is dead. Was Paul saying that he was crucified on the same cross? No, that's not what he meant. He's saying, similar to Jesus' death on the cross, I have taken my old man and I have put him on the cross, and he no longer lives. He says, it's not I that lives anymore, but Christ that lives in me. God has given him a new life, 
And that is what you need to believe. You need to believe that when Jesus died on the cross, he was buried in a borrowed tomb for three days, and then he rose up with that resurrected body, a new life, a new body. Paul says, that's exactly what happened to me. I took my old man and I nailed it to the cross so he won't live anymore. And then when God raised me up, he raised me up with a new man to walk in a newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. And so you can think about it like that. Here's a way that you can think about the new life. Baptism doesn't save you. The water that we put in that pool up there to baptize a new believer, that's not what washes away their sins. Before they even step into the water, they've been given a new life. Their sins have been washed away. They've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. That old man was crucified the day that they professed Jesus as their Savior. But the baptism is a symbolic representation of the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when a new believer is baptized, they're saying, my old man is dead, I am burying him, and I am raising up a new person in the Lord Jesus Christ. And through that baptism, they are letting everyone know that that's the decision that they made, and that's what has taken place in their life. So the indwelling Christ brings a new life. Number five, I think this is one of the most important parts is that the indwelling Christ is inseparable. Once you come into union with the Lord Jesus Christ, when God does something, he does it forever. He doesn't do something temporarily in a believer's life. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life lasts for all eternity. So he's not going to put himself into your life and then remove himself. He's going to stay with you forever and ever. It's an inseparable union. It's an inseparable relationship. Paul made another one of his lists in Romans chapter 8, verses 37 through 39. He said, I am persuaded that neither death, remember, top of the list, most important, Neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Isn't that good news? It's not a temporary union. It's not a temporary relationship. But God says, when you truly accept me as your Lord and Savior, when you repent of your sins and you ask me to come into your life and dwell within you, I'm going to be in you, among you, and with you for all eternity. So how do you get a grip when your life is coming apart? This glove is going to stay on my hand until I remove it. But your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is something that no person can remove. And God says, once I enter into your life, I'm there to stay. That relationship is going to go on and on and on. It's inseparable. John chapter 11, when Jesus was standing outside the grave of Lazarus, he told Martha this. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die die and he asked her this question do you believe this is that what you truly believe do you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sins of mankind was buried and rose again and that by faith when we accept him as our Lord and Savior that you'll never ever die you've got to believe all of that when you step out in faith and ask Jesus to come into your life and save you John chapter 10 Verse 28, he also said this, 
Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish and neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You see, once you're in the grip of grace, once you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, once you have become a child of God and he has you in, your gri in his grip, there's nothing that can take you out of that grip. Nothing. It's a union that is inseparable. It's for all eternity. The Bible says that we are sealed by the power of his Holy Spirit and we are in his grip to where nothing can take us away from that relationship that we have with him. And that's what this day is all about. You see, it was on the cross of Calvary that our sins were paid for. Past, present, and future. All of Jesus' blood was not poured out on the cross of Calvary. It was poured out long before that when he took the beating prior to going to the cross. When he was nailed to the cross, he became the one-time sacrifice for all of mankind's sins. But Jesus said, just as Moses created that, that serpent on the pole in the wilderness. People had to look to it to be healed. Jesus said, the Son of Man must be lifted up, and people must look to him for the remission of their sins. That's what the cross represents. But on that third day, the resurrection, that was what sealed the deal. That confirmed that Jesus was who he said he was. And so why is the resurrection so important. Why is Jesus' death so important to us? Because if Jesus did not rise up from the grave, then there's no way that he can live within inside of us. He said, I must die for the sins. I must be buried. I must rise again the third day. He says, if I don't rise again on the third day, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. He says this in John chapter 16, verse 7. He says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. You see, the disciples didn't want him to leave. He started talking about the crucifixion and his death. Peter, Peter said, Oh, we can't let that happen. But Jesus told Peter, He says, I've got to do this. If I do not go away, then the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. You see, number six, the indwelling Christ is accomplished only because of the resurrection. Jesus says, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe. Of, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. And in John 14, a passage we're all familiar with, Jesus told him this. He was talking about his crucifixion. He said, look, this all sounds bad. It sounds bleak. He says, don't let it bother you. In John 14, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. You see, if he would have stayed in that tomb, then he couldn't be preparing a place for us right now. And if he would have stayed in that tomb, his Holy Spirit would have never come to live in the life of a believer. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And so that empty tomb represents something else. It represents that Jesus is coming back one of these days. He's not going to leave us helpless and hopeless. He's not going to leave us here forever. One of these days, he's going to part the eastern sky. The trumpet's going to sound. The shout of the Lord is going to be heard. The dead in Christ will rise first. So my question today is this the indwelling Christ. Is it in you? Do you feel like that there's something missing in your life? 
Do you feel like you've completely lost your direction? You've lost all hope? Maybe you hear me talking about this eternal life. You say, Brother Tracy, I don't know for sure where I'd spend eternity at today if I died. And I ask people that question a lot of times. I ask them, you know, where would you, do you know for sure that you'd spend eternity in heaven if you die today? And some people say, well, you know, I hope so. <laughs> That's an automatic no right there. Because the Bible says you can know so. It says you don't have to guess. It says you can be sure of your eternal destination. So back to the Gatorade. Is, is it in you? Does Jesus Christ live in your life and in your heart? Do you know for sure that if you die today, you would spend eternity in heaven? Do you know for sure that you are a child of God? Could you stand before me right now? Or better yet, could you stand before God right now and say, yes, I have accepted your son as my personal Lord and Savior. I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection and I know right now that his Holy Spirit lives inside of me because I can't explain the things that's going on. Can you honestly say that? So this Gatorade, as long as it's in this bottle, it does me absolutely no good. Oh, I believe it'll help. I read everything here on the label. I understand the concept behind it. I know what it'll do. But you know what? As long as I leave it in that bottle, it does me absolutely no good. I go out there and work all day, sweat, and die of dehydration because that stuff stayed in the bottle. Even though I believed in the power that it has to replenish my body what it needs. Believing is one thing. Receiving it is another thing to receive what I believe in that this Gatorade can accomplish the seal has to be broken the lid has to be removed and then I have to receive it into my body for the power to start working inside of me see there are many people today that believe in God Oh yeah, I believe there's a God out there. I believe that there's an intelligent creator. I believe that there's someone who is in control of all things, coordinating all things, making things happen. I believe that. But have you received it? Oh yeah, I believe that Jesus was a good man. I believe that he was a prophet. I believe that he came to this earth and did something. I know that we celebrate Easter every year because of that. I know we celebrate Christmas every year because of that. I believe that something happened. But have you received it? By faith, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And so this fluid inside of this bottle, it, it, it can't enter my body by itself. I have to make some actions for that to take place. I have to be willing to receive what is inside of that body. I have to trust that the makers have done the right thing to put this stuff together and it won't poison my body and then I have to receive it and allow it to start working in my life. Listen to this verse. Write it down if you're writing a few things down in this passage of Galatians 2.20 on your outline if you have one. Because this is so, so important right here. John chapter 1, verse 12. If you want to turn to it and underline it, that would be great as well. John chapter 1, verse 12 says this. But as many as receive him... To them he gave the right to become the children of God. To those who believe in his name who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So does Jesus Christ live inside of you today?
Number one, do you believe he is who he said he was? Number two, do you believe that his death on the cross was a substitute for your sins? Number three, do you believe that he actually rose up out of the grave just as he said he would? Number four, do you believe that he's coming back again one of these days? Number five, have you accepted by faith Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Is there evidence that Jesus actually rose up from the barred tomb? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Because he lives right here. He lives inside of my heart. I don't deserve it. I, I didn't earn it. There was no way I could work for it. But one day as a 17-year-old boy, I knelt down on my knees. And I confess my sin and I ask Jesus to come into my life and save me. And I haven't been the same since then. H have I been perfect? Absolutely not. But when I did something wrong, I knew that it wasn't pleasing to the Lord. And as best as I could, I I I've always tried to move in his direction, in the direction that he's asked me to go in. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living no matter what men say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer and just the time I need him, he's always near. He walks with me. He talks with me. He lives inside of my heart. That's how I know that the resurrection actually took place. And you can live your life in that way as well today. In just a moment when the music plays, if you've never by faith received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, let today be that day. You say, Brother Tracy, I, I don't know how to make that happen. I, I've never accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior before. Don't worry about that. If God is calling you to become one of his children, all you do is you step out of that aisle in just a moment and you come see me and I'll tell you exactly how we can make that happen. The first thing that you need to know is that man has a sin problem. The Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Here's the thing about the Holy Spirit or God's Spirit or the Spirit of Christ coming to live inside of you. He's not going to come into a place where he's not welcome. He's not going to force his way into a place where he's unwanted. And he most definitely will not live in a place where sin is present. That's why that's the first step. God, I know that I've sinned. I know I've broken your commandments and I don't want to live that way anymore. I, I confess myself as a sinner and I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And he'll do that. He'll do that very thing. You see, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God in a place called hell. That's the bad news. But the good news is, is that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as John 1.12 says, as many as received him as Lord and Savior, those are the ones that he's given the right the privilege, the opportunity to become a child of God. Once you confess your sins to the Lord, you say, I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross and took the place of my sins. And by faith, I accept him as my Lord and Savior. If that's a commitment that you need to make today, during the invitation time, I invite you to come down and make that happen. Every head bowed, and every eye closed. This is a very quiet, a very private moment. We'll go as long as we need to during the invitation, but no longer than what is necessary. So I would say for you, if you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as soon as that first note is played, 
You know that God is talking to you right now. You already know it. Don't hesitate. You come let me know that that's a decision that you want to make, and I'll pray a prayer with you and tell you where to go from here. So I'm going to say a prayer, and the music's going to start. And when the music starts, you respond as the Lord is leading you. These front pews here will be open as altars. If you haven't been living the life that you know you're supposed to live, if you're already born again, if you know that you're a Christian, but you need to get some things right with the Lord, or maybe get some things right with someone else, take the time during this invitation and, and work that out with the Lord. Come down here and just pour your heart out to God and ask Him to guide you through that situation. Father God, we love you so much and we thank you for all you're doing. We thank you, Lord God, that you live inside of us. When we confess our sins and we receive you as Lord and Savior, you come to live inside of us and empower us for all eternity. Lord God, if there are believers here today that they're just not walking the way that they should or they've, they've had a relationship in their life that has gone wrong, I pray that they would seek your help. And Lord, I just pray that if there's any one person here that does not know you as Lord and Savior, if they can't honestly answer where they'd spend eternity at, that they would nail that down this morning. And by faith, they would receive you as their Lord and Savior, and their life would be eternally changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we all stand for the final hymn, as soon as the music sounds, we need to make a decision. This invitation.